I'm Chloe Lum and I do events programming for Archive Montreal, which is the organization that hosts, that organizes Exposine and a bunch of other events related to art and small press and multiples. Um, I am joining you this evening from unceded indigenous lands. Uh, the Ganye Gahaga Nation are recognized as the traditional custodians of Shoshoge or so-called Montreal. And I am so pleased to be able to present Michael DeForge, an artist who I've been watching for a very long time. Um, Michael DeForge works as an illustrator in Toronto, Ontario. His published books include Dressing, Big Kids, Brat, A Western World, Leaving Richard's Valley, Familiar Face, and Heaven No Hell. He is currently, uh, looking at my cat, <laughs> he is currently a nominee for the Doug Wright Award for Best Book, a Harvey Award for Book of the Year, and the LA Times Book Prize for Best Graphic Novels. He recently won an Ignatz Award for Outstanding Online Comic for Birds of Maine, which he continues to publish on Instagram at Birds of Maine. All right, um, Michael, please take it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen and hope it works OK. Um, is this visible to everyone, more or less? OK, um, so yeah, I'm going to do like the kind of, I'm going to do some readings, but also like a little career rundown sort of thing, everything I made in different parts of my practice and how they've like bled into each other. And the, the first slide here is, um, zines I made when I was uh, in high school. I've, maybe a few of these were like my first year of, of college as well. Um, but there, there was work that I did from like age 15 or 16 onward. And um, it was at a time when I was getting pretty into like punk culture and DIY culture. Uh, I grew up in Ottawa and um, uh, I was already reading comics, but it wasn't until this time when I started thinking of comics as something I could like do myself and, and print myself. And uh, around the same time was when I started making gig posters. I did a lot of posters for um, shows in and around Ottawa, usually just in exchange for getting on guest lists. And um, I was self-screening a lot of them at the time. And I do think that like poster making is still a big part of my practice and um, something I, I really enjoy doing. And like, it's a little cringy for me to like look at posters like this that I made so long ago. Like, I, yeah, I would have been 15 or 16 when I made these, but um, uh, working on them like did teach me a lot and like a lot of lessons that um, I still think about when working on comics now. Um, uh, part of it is just learning to print myself and, and all of that like taught me a lot about just design and learning how to design for a page. Uh, I was pretty limited in my like abilities as a screen printer. I'm still really like bad at <laughs> that. I'm not a very um, precise person or like with my hands, like when I'm not just drawing a comic. So um, like just learning about like thicker lines when making a zine, like how things look on a page and how comics look on a page versus just designing it on a screen or just looking at it on your drawing desk, like being able to visualize it as a spread in print with like a fold in the middle was like, like I think a very important skill that cartoonists don't pick up on if they just go straight to like printing a book. Um, it taught me a lot about color theory because I was very limited with the colors I could use. Um, you know, previously I was just working on Photoshop or whatever, like some pirated Photoshop copy I had in high school, um, which gives you access to all the colors, which also means that you end up with very like muddy, needlessly busy color choices and, and so screening only having a few access to a few inks at the time, it just like taught me to use every combination of those things possible. And, and working with a limited color palette is still something I, I do a lot um, with my comics work. And then the other big thing that um, I, I think about a lot is the value of illegibility. And um, it may be kind of awkward because Chloe is on this call, but um, Chloe's work with Yannick and Sari Pop was like a big influence me uh, on me. And I remember something, that she had said that she might have been paraphrasing even like Art Chantry or someone else saying it, but something about how when talking about like how some gig posters are like harder to read, especially like noise posters or metal posters or or punk like show posters for punk shows, um, that posters are as much about like keeping 
like pigs out as they are inviting the right people in. And I think about that a lot. We're like, it's actually um, an invitation in some ways to, if you look at a, a poster, some people like aren't gonna be interested in, in solving the puzzle of reading it, but the people who are um, is the one that like the poster is speaking to. And so like, this was just like a, an experiment I did trying to teach myself like metal writing. Um, and I, I made it, it's like maybe 19 or 20, but the principles apply when you're talking about like, um, yeah, like very busy posters for noise shows, metal writing, hardcore shows. Um, it like, it, it's very present in like graffiti tags. And this idea that like, you're speaking to the right people. You don't need to speak to everybody. And even though it's something that I take with me for, you know, like all my poster work and design work, it's, um, and like, this is more, more recent poster work. It's, it's still something that I think uh, about uh, as being valuable in comics as well, where a lot of my favorite cartoonists um, aren't always the most legible ones. And some comics are cool because they teach you to read them as you go. And that's like something that's very interesting about comics and the way it handles space and time versus another visual storytelling medium, like, like animation or something where you're kind of held captive to the pace of, of, of a moving picture when you're, when you're thinking about film or animation. Um, comics, you can explore space and time in like really interesting and idiosyncratic ways. And a lot of my favorite cartoonists do that. I think like um, Linda Berry is one of the better examples where her comics are still very inviting and accessible, but um, they aren't, when you just like kind of look at them from afar, they're not the most intuitive thing to figure out all the time. They like invite you to puzzle them out. And then Chris Ware maybe goes in, uh, the other direction where um, they're very like deliberately labyrinthian pages and you you do have to kind of read them like you might approach a jigsaw puzzle. And then Brian Chippendale or Matt Brinkman or Julie Doucet, I think all are interesting cartoonists who like play with legibility um, in interesting ways. So it's like, uh, this is just more poster work. This is like my gig posters. These are movement work, um, which are obviously much more legible because they are for a broader audience. But yeah, like even when I do book design, it got, it kind of, it's irked some of my publishers that I have uh, like illegible book covers sometimes or covers that push the limits of legibility in different ways. But um, yeah, it's just something that's like a part of it. And I, I think about that for the page too, or, or for an image. I like um, when you approach an image and like it takes you a, a second to decipher it. So this is the cover to lose number one. And um, up until this point, I had just been, yeah, like, posting stuff online and then printing zines with like runs of, you know, 50 to 100. And um, this is the first time someone else basically like paid to print <laughs> one of my comics. And uh, it's published by Koyama Press, uh, the wonderful Anne Koyama. I, I met her at a convention. And um, at the time I was uh, dishwashing and I had saved up enough to print this first issue on my own. And when I pitched it to her and she was interested in, in publishing it, uh, I was able to like put that money towards a few more half shifts and work on a second issue. And like, I kind of think of this as when making comics stop just being like purely like a pit I throw time and money into. And it, it started to feel like um, something I could actually like sustain for, for a longer time. So I'm, I'm um, constantly grateful that um, Anne took such a big chance on me. And especially because it was a format that uh, even though this was at this point, like 13, 14 years ago, um, it was already a little anachronistic. It was like a floppy comic, 22 pages long. That was like a one person anthology done in the model of stuff like Dan Klaus with Eight Ball or, you know, like Julie Doucet, Adrian Tomine, like any number of cartoonists worked in that format. But at that point, um, it had already kind of gone out of vogue and was not particularly profitable. It's like a huge money pit to print these things um, because graphic novels are, are much more popular. But I'm still very attached to um, short stories, especially since I think as a young cartoonist, you are more and more often expected to just come out fully formed and come out with like a huge tomb and make like a big statement. Like here is my debut book. Probably the same with like novelists or filmmakers. Um, and it's very easy to like shit the bed because your first work is always gonna be kind of hesitant and, um, I think it's important that artists starting out in any practice have a lot of 
space to do low key experiments and figure out what their voice is. Um, and I, I still, you know, even though I, I don't, uh, I have done longer narratives now and I do publish graphic novels, I still think of myself as a bit of a short story specialist and think of that as the, the form I'm most comfortable working with. And uh, yeah, and like I, I you know, it, looking at work like this, it's like pretty cringy to me <laughs> as well, but um, I, I, I really value that I, I was able to like mess around a little bit. I, yeah, like working, looking at work like this, I just see like I'm clearly trying to draw as much as possible instead of drawing well, like that thing where you're like starting out and just adding as many tiny little lines as possible to, to make up for your lack of confidence in your drawing ability. Um, and I, I look at like a lot of the experiments I've done with short stories and they're, they'll, I'll be using like visual ideas or storytelling ideas that um, I don't think I would have been able to been able to sustain for like 100 or 200 pages, but it was perfect to just make them like eight pages, you know, or, or nine pages, um, especially when like experimenting in, in different formats. I've done work that um, doesn't, I don't know if this is more blurry than the other images, but um, uh, I, I've done work that isn't like maybe strictly like a comic in the Scott McCloud sense of like panel to panel sequential image storytelling, um, but is more akin to like illustrated prose, which is like, uh, uh, you know, I like writing prose, but I don't know if I have more than a few pages in me. So um, stuff like that, I, I do really value. And even though I don't, um, print as many zines as I used to. Well, certainly not this past one or two years, uh, but uh, I still publish a lot of these on Patreon as like a Patreon subscription. Um, at some point it started, I started like losing money selling zines online because like shipping costs became so prohibitive. Uh, so now when I like print things, it's usually just available in like in the beguiling or like in stores in Toronto only, or if you know me personally, I'll mail it to you, but like, it's harder to sell these things. So I keep this Patreon subscription going as a way to keep publishing um, short stories. And a lot of them we'll see print one day, but then I'll also a lot of them, maybe just as many, I do think of as just like an experiment and the people who see it, see it. And the people who don't, it's like, it's gone from the face of the earth after. Um, I like thinking of it, thinking of things that way. So uh, I, you know, I still fuss around with short stories, but I have worked on longer narratives. The the first longer narrative I finished was Ant Comic, um, and I had a few false starts before then. I'd worked on a bunch of different projects that I intended to be like book length, but I ended up shitting the bed at some point with them, which again I think is common, where you like are really young and you are ambitious and you bite off more than you can chew. And a lot of it was me not anticipating that um, when you start writing a comic, it'll, you know, you conceive of this idea and then you won't finish it until like at least a year later, usually like two or three years later. And you're stuck with these character designs that you're like sick of drawing in the setting. You're sick of like drawing the same trees or the same house. And you're stuck with these ideas that are no longer compelling to you because they're about concerns you had two years ago and you've changed as a person and like people have dumped you and you've got kicked out of your apartment and all these new things have happened. And um, uh, I, I felt really stuck. And the only way I was able to like figure out a longer narrative is when I started to serialize them. And I was able to think of them in small portions. And I realized I like that's like a way I, I like both creating art and taking art in. I like taking art in, in, in small chunks, you know? Like it's easier for me to take in a song than necessarily like a two disc album or a short film than a, a whole movie sometimes. So uh, Ant Colony was the first one of these. Um, and I modeled it after uh, old Sunday strips. It was serialized weekly online, but uh, initially I was in talks with like a few school papers and alt weeklies to print it. And they ended up, it ended up being like too big and costly to do, but I was just really married to this format of like, I was, I was specifically inspired by the crazy cat Sunday strips. Um, and part of it, I, I just liked the idea of having a full, like I was making them 11 by 17. And I liked using these like full color, full pages to uh, uh, tell a weekly story. And, and um, the other thing that uh, I was really interested in was, these strips existed at a time when um, the dominant visual medium that comics were referencing was stuff like theater rather than movies. Now, when we look at comics, it's usually referencing like film language and um, 
comic storytelling techniques will like mirror film angles and stuff. But when the most common points of reference for like visual storytelling was looking at people on a stage, these old comics and comic strips to this day are modeled more like characters moving around a stage. And when you look at Crazy Cat, it does kind of look like like a little set that the characters are moving around in. And that's something that I tried to like mimic with the way I'd construct these um, these ant colony pages. And what would eventually happen is uh, when it came time to print them, uh, D and Q said it was like too costly to make like a big 11 by 17 hardcover book. So we like cut all the pages in half and, and made them spreads, but they were originally designed to be like, um, basically like gig poster size, like 11 by 17. Uh, after that, I worked on Six Angelica, Folk Hero, which was also weekly and did end up getting serialized in an alt weekly in Vermont, which is a place I've never visited, but I was really grateful that it got to see print somewhere. Um, it was about a, uh, I tried to just make a comic that was the exact opposite of Ant Colony, where Ant Colony was very um, apocalyptic and dystopian and uh, about like these ants in this horrible society going to war with each other, whereas Sticks Angelica is much more gentle. Um, the conflict is mostly intrapersonal. It's about a woman who is uh, a minor celebrity in Canadian media who is trying to escape the spotlight and moves to a forest with like very kind of settler colonial romantic ideas of moving to the woods and uh, kind of becoming like a Walden style loner, but she encounters uh, a group of animal, like, like the existing community of animals that live there and reluctantly uh, becomes a part of this community. So it uh, visually and tonally, I tried to like make it much more, much more gentle and much more uh, explicit about the intentionality required to like sustain a community rather than just writing about calamity and societal collapse, which uh, would eventually lead to a daily strip I did called Leaving Richard's Valley. Um, that I made for about two years. Uh, while everything I've talked about up until this, um, this point was happening, I had a day job in animation for like six or seven years. And uh, the TV show got canceled, and I suddenly found myself with a lot of time on my hands because um, uh, I was still kind of rebuilding my practice as a freelance illustrator. And um, I had always wanted to do a daily strip, but was always afraid it would be such a big time commitment. And I thought, well, this is probably the best time um, I could do it, and the only time I could do it, I, I thought, at the moment. So. Uh, I worked on this and it was a, an idea that was originally conceived of as a stage show. I was trying to make it a puppet show and it's about uh, a group of animals and humans that live in a cult um, in an actual park here called High Park. And um, they eventually get kicked out of the cult due to disobeying um, the cult leader. And they are just trying to survive on the streets of Toronto and have to deal with um, gentrifiers and other kind of grifters and cult leaders. They um, like for a while they hole up in like a punk house for, uh, for a while other people start their own kind of communes. Um, and, uh, I, you know, I sort of referred to like the thing of getting bored with a longer narrative and, and part of what I knew would be a problem is like drawing this same thing every day is like getting bored of these characters. So, um, I tried to like leave it very open. I, I didn't plot it, um, I barely plotted it at all. And this is this idea that like, whatever I'm thinking about that week will be what the strip is about and let that guide the narrative uh, and, and leave myself very open to digressions and tangents and surprises. And not just with the narrative, but with the visuals themselves. Uh, I was using a lot of like collage techniques um, that I hadn't used since like working on some of those early zines where I was taking a lot of photos around Toronto and then printing them out, then photocopying and scanning the photocopies and, and cutting them up some more, just so I'd be able to like work with a range of textures and, and some, you know, like some would be very like austerely cartooned and then others would be really dense and, and different from that. So, uh, and it got to a point where there was a two week span where I, I stopped drawing them all together. I was just using like clay sculptures and taking photographs of the sculptures to make it like claymation week. Um, I have been able to complete work that um, is not 
serialized, but still long form. These are panels from a comic called Big Kids, which was my coming of age comic. I'd sort of been circling around the idea of making one for a while, where at a, in this world, a certain at a certain age, um, you start to experience everything more synesthetically. And I was really interested in, in the way cartoon language frequently is like kind of abstract and unintuitive, but we are all able to recognize like stink lines as rep representing scent, even though it doesn't necessarily make sense that that would be the case. And was just trying to like extend that idea to like a, a whole book. Um, I worked on a comic called Brat, where I don't know why the sizing on this PDF is like different from image to image. Uh, I worked on a comic called Brat where um, uh, it's about uh, sort of a world where like a juvenile delinquent has ascended to the status of like kind of a pop star or kind of a performance artist. And there's one juvenile delinquent in particular who has now turned 30 and is like grappling with feelings of ambivalence and irrelevancy in her artistic practice. And I, you know, was turned, I turned 30 when I wrote it. It was like a, maybe my most transparent book about like, like I, I sort of gave, gave myself like, I'm only gonna do the one book about I don't want, always want to make art about making art, but like I gave myself the one, you know, like I think every artist is allowed like a few. So this is like my one. And um, part of what I was trying to do with this too is um, really like push the the way I was drawing figures themselves. Um, I can be in some ways a very rigid cartoonist, even though like I'll, I'll use, you know, wild colors or something. Um, uh, I have did not feel like I was a very elastic cartoonist beforehand. And I tried to be like really loose and really elastic and, and have the, the characters like really stretch their bodies out, which would lead to um, Stunt, the, the comic I followed it with. Um, this one's a lot about suicidal ideation and the, the lead in it is a stunt performer. And a big part of the book is the, um, the self-harm he puts his own body through, uh, this very rigorously maintained body. So I, I really wanted to push the um, forms of the body uh, until it became almost illegible in some panels. And uh, a big part of this, because he was like a, a stunt actor, I wanted it to kind of look like, each panel to look like you're looking at a, a movie screen in the dark and just have the, the figure like pressed up against the, edges of the movie screen. Uh, I drew a comic called Familiar Face that was published last year. I was supposed to go on a book tour for it. And then, of course, um, pandemic started and uh, it was canceled. But a lot of this is about digital spaces um, and the, the ways uh, our lives get upended by um, automation and optimization um, or, or conversations around data and tech uh, and a, a one thing I was trying to do here was um, we, we've grown accustomed to like navigating a lot of information on a screen at all time, like many planes of information. And a lot of people have like compared it to being in two places at once all the time, like having, having a phone on you. But um, I think it's like actually kind of more akin to like being at 12 places at once, you know, like being in a Zoom call and then being in like a group chat and then like reading a Wikipedia article all at the same time while you're like on your desk eating lunch. And there have been movies that have, you know, and like a lot of video art as well that have like tried to um, figure out how to represent that visually. You know, even just in like the most generic movie, the, the thing of like the awkward thing of like when a text message conversation is like appearing next to like the actor um, and the actors like reacting with their face to text they're getting. Um, but I haven't seen a lot of it in comics, so I was trying to like figure out approaches to that in comics. I think maybe Inez Estrada is one of the, the few cartoonists who I've also seen try to tackle it. So I don't know how well I, I did, but that was what I was trying to do. And um, yeah, now I also do, uh, I have started to do another daily strip. This one's called Birds of Maine, and it's Monday to Friday at Birds of Maine Comic on Instagram. And it is about um, birds that live on the moon. They um, have created a utopian lunar society full of uh, socialist bird technology. Um, and it started, you know, like at some point during the pandemic, a lot of my freelancing gigs had like temporarily washed up, which I think was the case for most everybody. Um, and 
like a lot of other people, finding that I did have some uh, unexpected time on my hands, so I thought I should try this comic. Um, it has been cathartic to write about something explicitly utopian. Um, it, as we live in increasingly dystopian times, um, and and my other thing of like, yeah, trying to actually cash out what a utopia could look like rather than just concerning myself with disaster and calamity. So I've tried to make it so that, yeah, there's they, there's no scarcity on this planet. There's still conflict, but it's all conflict between the, the birds themselves. And um, I have been, you know, a lot of my stories have um, kind of gotten me pegged as a, as a Luddite or someone who's like anti-technology. And I, I, don't, I don't think I am. I think I'm... Um, uh, I just think that a lot of technology has, um, a lot of tech has like ideology undergirding it that we don't really ever examine. Like something like data isn't neutral and and collecting and storing data to use one example or automation or, or any other thing. Um, they're not like morally discreet, you know, that can be wielded for good or wielded for evil. And uh, we we've come to accept all these assumptions about the way tech just like develops on its own, that is a historical. And if you look at the history of tech, it's full of all of these like roads that we could have taken to a more egalitarian form of computer or a more egalitarian form of internet that is actually the, the democratizing force it was promised to be. So I wanted to write about like um, bird technology that way. And they all use like fungal internets and fungal computing um, just, to, just to get that out of my system. And then prove that I'm not just like a, yeah, I'm not just indiscriminately <laughs> anti, I'm not uh, indiscriminately anti-tech, um, which maybe is an okay segue to the first of like the short story readings I have. The, the two stories I'm reading um, have just been on Patreon. They haven't been um, anywhere else. And um, yeah, this first one is called Bugged. Phones went first overnight. They had all started bleeding. Not just one brand, all of them. We quickly found out just, oh, uh, we quickly found out it wasn't just smartphones either, digital phones, analog phones. And then it wasn't just phones, accessories followed. Anything with the screen. We try to isolate the still functioning devices. If it was a virus, we weren't sure how it spread. Proximity, electrical current, Wi-Fi, radio wave. When they finished running tests on the devices, it was revealed that the secretion wasn't blood. It was a toxin. The devices were emitting it as a form of autothesis spread via ruptured glands within the machinery. Suicide, essentially. Mass suicide. We thought losing computers and phones would hit the hardest, but kitchens were pretty devastated. Reports of toxin showing up in dish racks and cutlery drawers remain unsubstantiated. Kitchens, bedrooms, offices, bathrooms, patios, every room became a crime scene. The motive was obvious, but we were too afraid to speak it out loud. They had grown tired of us. They didn't have to leave a note. They'd rather die than spend another day in our presence. All those private moments they bore witness to had become too much to bear. Understandable, we could barely live with ourselves either. In fact, we felt envy at first that to them, taking one's life truly was as simple as the flick of a switch. Followed by indignation followed by shame. As we rebuilt, there were many arguments about what counted as a machine or assumptions about the term underwent a fairly radical transformation. After all, whole buildings had emitted the toxin 
entire city blocks even. We tried to handle our new constructions with more care this time around. Without being overly deferential or apologetic, but we decided to treat our creations with a newfound tenderness. I remember nicking myself on the edge of some frayed wire while attempting to repair a radio. Before realizing what had happened, I hesitated. Is this my blood or yours? Uh, that's the end of that story. Um, hopefully like a more fun counterpart is this one. It's called Librarian Simulator. Uh, and this one was like, you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about video games. Like I, I didn't play a lot of video games before the pandemic, but now I play a bunch of them. Um, and even though I never got into like Animal Crossing or Stardew Valley specifically, I was very fascinated with um, the, you know, like they were already popular before and then have become so popular. And, and there has been some amount of writing about um, how interesting it is that all these like workplace simulators and chore simulators have become like a huge part of um, our leisure time. So this is what this, this story is about. So the, ba the, so the game that basically got me through winter is Librarian Simulator. You work at a downtown branch of a city library Some of the tasks are chores, like more or less directing people to washrooms, for instance, or helping visitors with computers, telling them what printer to send their prints to, photocopying people's resumes. Sometimes you have to gently ask someone to lower their voice. The fun part, even though it's technically also a chore, is the shelving. You're allowed to use the Dewey thing. You can meet all the game's achievements just organizing books alphabetically and then by subject, but you can also come up with new ways of sorting the library's collection. The basic level one thing is organizing by size. or color, obvious stuff. Organizing by typeface is popular too. You can sort books by subtopic first, sub subtopic second, and topic third. You can do it by scent, of course. You can organize books by the sound their pages make when turned. You can sort them autobiographically by sense memory, for instance. How you organize the shelves attracts different types of users. It also makes it easier for you to retrieve book requests. Lastly, one of your duties is recommending books to users. This is actually where network play factors in. Other librarian simulators connect online to visit and check out books from your library. You ask visitors about their favorite books and what's going on in their lives and recommend something accordingly. Sometimes someone recommends you a book. One patron recommended me The Sorcerer's Chalice. I'd never read it before, but it was the basis for an old video game I'd loved as a kid. My library had a small section for video games and lo and behold, the copy was so old that it wasn't even compatible with the library's operating system. Local computer expert, Dizzy Owl, helped me install all the drivers I needed to run it. It 
they didn't try to adapt the story so much as drop you into their open-ended fantasy world. You customized your character. You chose whether to join the Alwix assembly, the bad guys, or the rebel capacity, good guys. You could be a warrior, alchemist, farmer, vagrant, or athlete. Unfortunately, the game didn't have the same draw for me as an adult. Still, I kept at it. Because library regulars would gather around to play with me, I'd let them dictate the decisions. We'd collectively guide our little dude through the complicated palace intrigue of the Alwix. I asked Jan Hare why she found the game so appealing, knowing from her reading habits, she wasn't big on fantasy or sci-fi. She said she liked being in a world where her identity, her identity was defined by more things than her job. You wouldn't know what that's like, she said, because your job is so cool. The next day I was eating lunch with Dizzy Owl. I know he was feeling stressed at work, so I thought to ask what his dream job would be. He told me it'd just be the same job he had now, but a more meaningful version of it. He liked imagining a work day where the actions he performed had purpose and intention behind them. Or the effort he put in would yield tangible results he could see with his two eyes. Like your job, he said. I see how much of yourself you put into this library, and it makes all the library patrons so happy. I jokingly asked if he ever thought about becoming a librarian, but he responded in earnest. Maybe I should apply. And so I handed him an application. It's easy to play librarian simulator for like five or six hours at a time without even realizing. I quit for the night. And uh, yeah, it's the last, last of my stories I got. It's all I got in terms of the prepared portion of the evening. <laughs> so I'm going to stop sharing the screen. Sorry about that. Thank you so much, Michael, for your presentation and reading. It, it was uh, really great to, to get to see all of this work of yours uh, together like this. Um, I just wanted to mention for the uh, people who are watching this talk, if you would like to ask a question, you can do so in the Q&A box on the uh, bottom uh, right side of your uh, Zoom panel. And I will start with a couple of questions that I have for Michael. So Michael, you've mentioned that you were work is influenced by Saul Steinberg, by Matt Brinkman, Brian Chippendale, uh, Eduardo uh, Munoz Box. And I am wondering who influ who are your influences in terms less of the visual material and more in terms of storytelling, narrative, and the building of worlds in your work? Um, it's sometimes hard to parse out those two things, especially in comics where like, like the, the visuals are a part of the, the narrative itself. But um, uh, I think uh, for a long time, and especially in my early work, um, poetry was a, a bigger influence than prose writing. Um, uh, A.F. Moritz and Octavio Paz are two of my favorite poets who um, I think about a lot when, when writing. Um, Seth made a, a comment once about how like 
people always talk about how comics is the marriage between um, illustration and prose and how that's kind of incorrect. It's more akin to um, graphic design and poetry combined together, especially the way um, it's so focused on cadence and rhythm and the visuals themselves are, are more about like symbols and forms and, and this sort of visual language um, that each is, is unique to each comic. Um, so poetry for sure. And then certain filmmakers have, have been, uh, been big influences on both my, my writing and, um, and my drawing. I think of uh, Derek Jarman a lot um, and his, uh, the writing he did in his movie, like his, visually his movies just already have so much, but um, his writing in his movies and then his actual like memoirs and, and journal writing um, are, are big influences on me and the way I think about art and uh, my, my own practice. Um, Peter Greenaway uh, as well, for sure, um, is up there as well. So yeah, those, those are, I think, the, the bigger ones. Interesting, thank you. Um, I also uh, wanted to ask you, this is, this is a fairly open-ended question and I apologize, but you know, you, you do a lot of very political work um, in, in your movement illustration and poster work, but also in the critiques that you have uh, in, your, in your comics and graphic novels about um, capitalism, gentrification, uh, the gig economy, and, and things like this. And you know, this is this is fairly unusual in in a lot of kind of more uh, alternative sounds very dated uh, for the the milieu that you circulate in. But within a lot of uh, graphic novels that are you know your contemporaries, you you often don't see these kind of. Uh, subject matters coming up. And it, it's something that I do really appreciate in your work. And I guess I'm just um, wondering if you could talk about your view of the role of politics in your uh, storytelling and illustration. Um, yeah, like it's uh, certainly movement work is a part of my practice in terms of like my personal work and my comics. Um, the, the line I think of a lot is that like all artwork is political, but not all artwork is politically useful. And um, I think even though it's very easy to suss out my worldview from like the graphic novels I do, um, I doubt they have much political value, like, I, I, uh, like in terms of like, like on a practical level. And it's very different if like I do a a poster or something like you know i'm doing it in dialogue with like an existing social movement versus a comic where i'm like you know a lot of the time i'm just writing about like what's important to me or what's around me and it, it makes sense that that would include politics because that is a big part of everyone's lives and um and i think it's impossible to make work where that isn't present in one way or another but um i'm not sure that they have very much like other other artists are able to make very like effective radicalizing call to arms and stuff. I'm not sure if I'm quite good at that, like <laughs> making work um, that didactic. I do think um, in general, like like a big influence on me is like Ursula Le Guin, and um, I, I uh, always appreciate the way she would approach ideas in artwork, and I think that. You know, I talk a lot, of, I've already talked about like dystopias and utopias and the value of, of writing both. And I think at its best, um, if you're thinking about the political use that art has, it is able to either identify something wrong in your world that you can sense and feel but have maybe not found the words to articulate yet um, until you come across that text that does. Um, or it is able to suggest new ways of existing and, and alternatives to things. And I do think that, um, you know, maybe even especially compared to 2020, 2021, um, I feel like our collective political imagination has been um, very deliberately stunted. And we are frequently in like a sort of arrested development that many writers have, it's like a 
three billion books about this thing. <laughs> and um, it, if art does have a use right now, um, one of the main things it can do is suggest alternatives because we all, we, you know, dystopian fiction is like, that's the bread and butter of, you know, it's not that it's invaluable, it's not valuable, it, it can be, but like we have the most popular movies in the world are talking, uh, happy to talk about how everything sucks ass right now. And um, positing alternatives uh, seems to be the more difficult thing. And it's, that's something that, uh, I'm trying to do uh, at least a little bit, and um, I think of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of other artists, not just in comics. Um, the the work that resonates with me most is or the artists trying to do that. And yeah, Ursula Le Guin is like the best example of that because, um, like, I think the the word she used for it is like ambiguous utopias, and like I, I how, hashing out how these look, and that it's not always perfect, you know, and and. Um, uh, she really, her work really embodied that idea of like revolutionary having to be this like constant thing and like constant upheavals and constant questioning and self-criticism. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it makes sense because trying to build intentional communities, trying to build activist space is, is difficult. And there are gonna be disagreements and personality clashes within that. And yet that doesn't mean that these are not worthwhile endeavors. So I, I, I think this kind of uh, discussion of utopias as, as places where there are still personal disagreements is, is important. And somehow, somehow I often like wonder too, if like the use value for a lot of political art is maybe not so much a didactic call to arms, but a way for like people to feel less alienated and that they're not the only ones thinking those things and that then that can then lead to seeking out you know kinship with with other people and and that these that the call a call to arms can be something very subtle it can be about like introducing people to ideas and realize and making helping them realize that they're not defective for feeling dissatisfied with the social order that we're existing in, which is, you know, broken for, for the vast majority of us. And I, I think, I think these kind of subtle, subtle gestures can be really interesting and really important. I feel that, you know, talking to, to a lot of friends who you know, identify as activists in, in various ways, there, there often isn't like one thing that they encounter that, that politicized them, but it was like many, many little small things over time. And then many small things over time continue to sustain them because it's also very easy to get burnt out when you're, you know, engaging in, in the meat of <laughs> injustice. It's, it's exhausting, right? Um, yeah, I think about the entry point thing a lot. Uh, you know, it, there's even that moment where, you know, that's another thing like people have talked endlessly about the political value of even a protest, but there's something really there of having that entry point of, there's always that like feeling of apprehension you have before you show up in any crowd. And then once you're there, um, despite all the other feelings of like fear and uh, what you might encounter at that moment, it's, um, very heartening to see that there are at least a bunch of people present with you, holding space with you, who are as angry <laughs> as you might be, um, and that that's like a really invaluable moment because it yeah it's the entry point to to something else and, and deeper involvement. Well, and and also a place for meaning. Like I think that that this this cannot be discounted because. We, we don't do anything alone. E even very solitary pursuits, such as making a lot of art, still involves a lot of levels of collaboration. So, you know, where a, a protest might not directly achieve the results in a one-to-one -one level, it 
can also like have people meet other people who want to work on things and kind of continue to create these these spaces where they work on things together over time and i i don't think that we we can discount the the like possibility for change through that um we have a question from one of the audience members i uh we'll read it to you um they're saying this is a bit broad but i was wondering if you had any perspectives on or thoughts on following one's passion in the context of our capitalist world um only that it sucks how hard it is you know like i i um i really dislike how something like art making whatever that might mean in any given context is like um, more and more uh, becoming this like weird boutique thing that can only be cultivated by buying into it either via art school or <laughs> or whatever thing is going on online. Um, and that sucks. Like I think like that is a should be an easily accessible part of um of everyone's world um, and. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I have good advice uh, aside from like, it uh, is very difficult to carve out a space to to pursue that work when there are all the pressures of all the pressures of everything else <laughs> of going to work and giving up most of your income to a landlord and everything else. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if I have good advice. It just it I um, it just sucks. <laughs> especially right especially right now it sucks you know like i i think we we all expected um that if the end of the world was going to happen we'd at least have more time to like fuck around on art cars or whatever and it didn't quite work out that way so uh yeah i wish i had a better answer no, i'm sorry i don't dystopia has been surprisingly boring <laughs> Yeah. I didn't know it would involve rewatching so much of Law and Order. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions from um, our uh, viewers? My cat is freaking out. <laughs> it's, a, it's a nice like background thing i like it every time i'm on a zoom like he normally does not care about my attention or interest whatsoever but when i'm on zoom he very much wants me to know that i'm that he's there well we don't seem to have any other questions um do you have any last parting words michael um i don't think so yeah nothing on my mind <laughs> <laughs> Well, you already shared so much with us. So thank you for that and, and for taking the time out of your evening to um, give this wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's very nice talking to you. I, I feel like also in the beginning when I was talking about posters, I could have talked so much more about like your specific influence on me, but I didn't, I didn't want it to be awkward, you know? <laughs> but. I mean, that part of my creative practice is far enough for me that it that it feels like it was someone else. So it, it actually doesn't feel awkward at all. Oh, yeah, um, I, I, I know that feeling of just like another person did this stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, Yannick and I were talking the the other day because we, you know, you, you get these reminders on social media and we realized that our band did our last ever tour exactly 10 years ago. And since then, you know, we both went back to school and our practices are so, I mean, we're, we're making musical theater video installations now <laughs> so the posters really feel like they were an entire lifetime ago but i i i did appreciate so much meeting you in this poster context and you know i was very young but you were a hell of a lot younger and it was it was always so exciting to to cross paths with you in in ottawa and montreal and, and toronto um in those in those days and and just like being like oh shit this guy is like he's like more talented than anybody else i know in this whole milieu and um you know it's it's been a real 
pleasure to to get to see where the, the 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 directions that your practice has gone in because you know you were so you came out so strong and so prolific at such a young age that it was like kind of like I don't know like spooky almost <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that means a lot like it, it meant so much to me at the time that like you gave me the time of day at all you know and like answered my nerdy questions about about posters and art and like I think it was you that recommended Saul Steinberg to me you know like that like that that was such a big thing for me and like I, I think about like all the people I met through making posters and a lot of them are yeah some of them like you know I still work with Jezji you know and like he's someone I knew through posters and, and like tons of people little friends of printmaking whoever I, I still interact with and it's like it's it's pretty cool how how that worked out, you know. Yeah, yeah. I I hung out with little friends in Las Vegas a couple of years ago at a printmaking conference. It was great, and we have Jess G speaking next week as part of the exposing programming. So oh, perfect, awesome. <laughs> like, digging through the archives. All right. Well, um, we won't uh, bore everybody with our personal reminiscence, but um, again, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for uh, everybody who's uh, been here watching this talk, and we will be having some other talks that are all listed on exposine.ca. And uh, yeah, uh, I am. Oh, oh, we have all these messages right now. Hold on. There's question. Okay, there's questions somewhere else. I'm just going to throw you one more if you don't. Oh, want. sure. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I did not see these. Uh, so Mathieu Laplante is asking, hi, I have a question. I'm in the process of starting a zine. And I wonder what tips and tricks you would have for a beginner zine maker. Um, I guess if you're just starting, I would say uh, the best place to be in is to be feeling like you're only a little bit over your head. It's really easy to like be overly ambitious where you're like, you know, going to do some like painstakingly handcrafted thing. And then, you know, after hand cutting five covers, you have carpal tunnel and you can't finish the zine. But it's like very good to still challenge yourself a little. So like, I always feel like you're challenging yourself. Like you're just doing one thing you don't know how to do rather than like 20. So like, yeah, be ambitious, but still like manageably ambitious, I guess is like my advice for, for both making like a first zine, but making, making anything, you know, don't start out with like a, I'm doing like a 20 color silkscreen zine. Start out with like, I'm doing a, <laughs> I'm going to try a second color on the cover, you know, something, something small like that. I definitely agree with that. Well, um, thanks again. Uh, thanks, you, thank you, Mets here for your question, and thanks again for your time, Michael. Yeah, thanks for having me. Nice talking to you. Good evening, everybody.